Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this activity titled COVID-19 Impact on Caring for Your Patients with Hematologic Malignancies. My name is Sagar Lonial. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at the Winship Cancer Institute of Emory University. We hope that you will find this discussion to be both informative and educational. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce my esteemed colleagues for joining me today. We'll start off with uh, Dr. Carlos Del Rio. Carlos, you want to introduce yourself and tell people what you do? Yeah, Carlos Del Rio. I'm a professor of uh, medicine and infectious disease here at Emory University. I'm also a professor of epidemiology and, and global health at the Rollins School of Public Health, and I'm the executive associate dean of Emory Donna Grady Memorial Hospital. Thanks, Carlos. And uh, Dr. Gail Robos. Gail, you want to give us a quick little intro? Hi, everybody. I'm also a professor of medicine. I uh, am the director of the clinical and translational leukemia programs at Weill Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian Hospital, which is currently, I would say, the epicenter of the epicenter of the uh, ongoing COVID nightmare. Thanks, Gail. Uh, and Dr. Uh, John Leonard. John, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm John Leonard. I'm a professor of medicine and uh, executive vice chair in the Department of Medicine and senior associate dean at Weill Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian Hospital, also a lymphoma physician and researcher. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, and for reference, these are our disclosures. Uh, and um, this webinar has been provided by BioAscend. BioAscend is an independent medical education company committed to supporting healthcare providers in their efforts to translate innovative science into clinical practice. So thank you all for joining us, and I thank my colleagues for taking some time in the middle of a crazy, hectic schedule. Uh, so we've got a number of topics to, co to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about where COVID-19 is, talk about the impact of COVID-19 on clinical practice and our ability to treat patients with heme malignancy. Uh, get insights from my colleagues on how COVID-19 has impacted their own personal practice and recommendations they may have for people, uh, and then talk about the impact on transplant, perhaps institutional differences, and then talk a little bit about clinical trials towards the end. So why don't we start with Dr. Del Rio, uh, who can give us a quick little intro on where we are now with the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the other issues that have come up from a, from a medical and a, 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 a school of public health perspective. Carlos? And thank you, Sagar, and a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, let me start by saying that the information is rapidly changing in this epidemic, and what we learn today is not necessarily what applies tomorrow. So clearly, I've never seen an epidemic that so quickly uh, things are becoming obsolete and we're changing things, but I'll try to run you with some of the things where we stand in knowledge today. So the uh, the viruses that we're talking about, this is a disease caused by a virus that is a coronavirus family. And coronavirus are viruses that, that infect animals. And, uh, and they are, they're named after a, a protein in their surface that gives that, that aspect of a crown or a corona. They're responsible for about a 10 to 30% of common colds. And uh, two coronaviruses, the beta coronaviruses that produce very severe disease are SARS and MERS. And, uh, and this newly described uh, COVID-19 also causes severe pneumonia. The, this virus was first described, the syndrome was first described in December 2019 in Wuhan, China. And there are many coronaviruses that live in bats. So bats clearly have a role to play in the transmission and in, the, in these viruses. The, uh, the family of coronaviruses are divided into different groups. And the current virus that we're talking about, this, this SARS-CoV-2, sits very, very close to the SARS coronavirus right here in this family. And it's sort of a far away from the MERS coronavirus or some other coronaviruses. So this is, and there are two bad coronaviruses that are in the same group of the lineage B uh, coronaviruses. And what's important is that these two viruses use the ACE2 receptor, the angiotensin conversion enzyme 2 receptor to gain access into cells. This virus, uh, as I said, used the ACE2 receptor and this receptor is present in lung and heart in the GI tract and kidneys, and therefore it's not surprising that we have manifestations, not only in the lungs, but in the heart, in the GI tract, and in the kidneys. As I said, there are three sort of big coronaviruses, you know, SARS, MERS, and, and COVID-19, and I'll talk about a couple of issues here. Uh, the first one is, this is where we are globally, and right now uh, the US is, is about 26% uh, of the global burden of diseases in the US, and, and when I talk about when we talk about New York, and we'll hear later from our colleagues at Wild Cornell, you know, Wild Cornell is, is about 40, you know, New York's about 40% of the cases in 
in the U.S. So it's about literally close to 10 percent of the cases globally are now in New York City. So that is the epicenter of the epicenter. And I want to, to remind people that this is what exponential growth means. Exponential growth means that it took us 67 days to go from one case to 100,000 cases, then 11 days to the second 100,000, four days to the third 100,000, and so on and so on. So exponential growth is, is a very rapid growth. And if you have in your community 30 cases today, that means you can make the math and see when you're going to be at 2,000 cases. You know, I look at our data in many cities and I said, we're just two weeks or three weeks behind where New York was in this exponential growth. And this is how cases in the U.S. are growing. And I want to move to the next slide because this sort of is, is a summary of cases per 100,000 population, the deaths per 100,000 population, and the mortality. And it's a couple of days old, but basically what it's showing is that the mortality has been, you know, somewhere between one to about 4%, depending where you are, and depending more importantly of who the population affected. So Washington State impacted a lot of elderly individuals in nursing homes, not surprising, their mortality is much higher than other cities that have had a much younger population impacted. Now, one issue that is of concern to many of us is that if you look at this map of where the mortality, you know, in the U.S. is, besides New York, you start noticing foci of increased mortality from COVID in the South. And this is important because in the South, we also have a, a high prevalence of diabetes, of hypertension, and of many diseases that are comorbidities for this illness. So one of the things that we uh, like to talk about is how this is transmitted. It's transmitted through respiratory droplets, and it's also transmitted by contamination of surfaces. And a question that frequently is asked is, well, you know, how about what is the issue with contamination of surfaces? Well, we know that the coronaviruses are able to remain on inanimate surfaces for up to nine days. Now, the temperature is over 30 degrees, so a lot shorter. But obviously, we don't know exactly how much is, it is involving transmission, but increasingly we believe that this inanimate uh, contamination is probably an important part of the transmission in many places. And cleaning and disinfection, the good news, it works very quickly to decrease contamination of surfaces. The clinical presentation, and we can talk about this later in, in a more discussion, but about 80% 80, 80 of the patients have a very mild illness. And what that means, the good news is they have a mild illness. The bad news is they have a mild illness because they continue about their day and they're able to then you know, infect other people. Now about 20 to 30, 20% 20 of people require hospitalization and about five to 10% end up in mechanical ventilation in the ICU. So these are the risk factors for, for, for severe disease. And as you can see, you know, clearly uh, many of them are things that you know, are, are very common in our populations, including age and other factors. And again, the mortality is low. It's about 1% until you start getting, the older you get, the higher the mortality. But look at the comorbid conditions that increase mortality. And one of them, a big one, is obviously cancer. And that's why we're talking about this here. Now, the big challenge, obviously, is the ICU challenge, right? Because we simply don't have enough ICU beds and we don't have enough ventilators in our country, despite the fact that we have, is a country that per capita has a high number of ICU beds. Now, what about uh, COVID and cancer? Well, there's uh, some literature published on this coming from China, but the bottom line is we see a higher incidence of complications in patients with cancer. Uh, I want to just point to everybody in this webinar to go to the Institute for Healthcare Metric and Evaluation site because there's some good, very good graphs and other predictions that you can look at at your state level. But roughly, uh, let's move on to therapy. I mean, there's a lot of drugs, a lot of therapies that have been tried. I'm not going to go into each one of them, but just a very quick mention of one of them, which is from Desivir. This is a nucleoside analog that inhibits the RNA direct, directed RNA polymerase. It is currently being tested. It's one of the most promising agents. There, there's six ongoing clinical trials, for four of them here in the U.S. The other drug that you hear a lot about is uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Again, this is a drug that that increases endosomal pH requiring, uh, required by the virus to fusion and interferes with the glycosylation of cellular receptors to SARS-CoV-2. It also has immunomodulating activity. But the data is very mixed on the use of this drug. And in fact, here's data from one of the clinical trials. And at the end of the day, it really showed no significant uh, impact. And we are, we are all very concerned about the side effects of this drug. So a lot of uh, concerns about whether it's, it's something that we ought to be recommending. Lopinavir or Tonavir, which is a uh, 
A mixture of two protease inhibitors used for HIV has also been tried and has been recommended, but from this clinical trial published in Journal Medicine, it did not show any significant impact. And finally, there are some immunomodulating agents, and many of them used in cancer, and I'll let my cancer experts talk about those later and how they're being used, but obviously a lot of immunomodulating agents have been suggested to be used. So testing is something that uh, we're doing, trying to do our best to scale up, and there's many samples you can get, but nasopharyngeal is typically what we do. Uh, it's, it's more and more available, and is now available in commercial sites, but really we're still having a, a throughput issue, a supply issue, and, and the U.S. is just not getting to where it needs to go as far as testing. This shows you, for example, we, we, in, in the red line here, you can see how testing in the U.S. has been scaled up. We're now doing over 100,000 tests per day, but the reality is if you look for 100,000 population, we're still pretty low, way below where South Korea, for example, is. So we really have to scale up testing a lot more in our country if we really want to get to where we want to. Personal protective equipment is something important to have, and hospitals are doing a, a yeoman's job trying to ensure that we all have protect, personal protective equipment. And there's obviously challenging in procuring, there's challenges in, you know, the big challenge in my mind, I wanna hear what people in New York say, is the presence of, of, of many mild infections, difficult to identify in people who are, have mild infection, and probably a lot of those contributing to transmission, especially in our healthcare settings. A lot of questions about masks, and I just show this because you know the CDC just came out with universal masking. This is the data on the protective effectiveness of masks. So an A95 mask has about a 90% effectiveness in protecting us from a virus. A surgical mask like this one, a surgical mask about a 30 to 40%, a bandana about 10%, and a dust mask about 6%. And again, the use of universal vaccine ma masking is not to prevent us from getting the infection, but it's actually to prevent people with asymptomatic infections to transmit it to others. And a recent study from Yale suggests that if we did this, we would probably reduce infections by about 10%. So a little bit about non-pharmacological measures and just to end talk about this whole idea of trying to, to, to flatten the curve, to really spread out the number of people who are infected over time, not to overwhelm our healthcare system and the whole concept of social distancing. And I wanna show this one graph on social distancing because I think it's very important that we think about this. If you have one infected person in your community and you do nothing, by the end of five days, you'll have 2.5 infected individuals. By the end of 30 days, you will have 400 infected individuals. But if you're able to decrease contact by 75%, then one infected person leads to less than one infected individual. And at the end of 30 days, you have 2.5 infected persons. So really social distancing, it works in a dramatic way to decrease transmission to others. And that's why it's so important to implement it. And it's, begin, it's indeed showing impact. Here we show the, the, what is happening in mobility across our cities and how we're seeing an impact. I want to end just by, by showing this uh, sort of a, a, a tool we developed here at Emory, the coronavirus checker, and something that I've found very useful to give to patients and to relatives and others to see, to assess, to do a self-assessment of whether they may have or not have the disease and what they need to do as far as testing and care for themselves. And finally, I'll conclude by saying that as we're gonna hear from people in New York, I mentioned to people outside New York that things are gonna get worse before they get better, that you need to be prepared for the works and, and, and hope for the best, that this is gonna last three or four months and there'll be significant pain. We need to protect our healthcare workers and we also need to prepare, be prepared as some of our friends, families, colleagues are likely gonna get infected and maybe even you know, die. And we therefore need to provide psychological support and counseling to our, to our colleagues and to our people in our work. And we, we can make a difference as persons, as society, as healthcare systems. We have to promote social distancing. And we wanna make sure that those sick and with fever and respiratory symptoms stay home. But I also remind people that this too shall pass. How long it lasts really is up to us and up to the interventions we implement. And with that, Sagar, I'll end and pass it over to you. Thanks, Carlos. That's a really nice intro and sort of setup, I think, for a lot of what we're going to talk about in a highly specialized uh, group of patients that certainly are at higher risk for complications if they get uh, if they get COVID-19. So let me ask you this, um, just to sort of wrap up your section. Do you think, um, and I, I'm I'm referencing some of the the heat maps that you see on the New York Times website. Do you think that perhaps we are making an impact with just a few weeks of social distancing? Uh, and travel restrictions and things along those lines. I, I think we are, and I think we are. And again, I wish we had done it earlier because we wouldn't be where we are had we implemented social distancing earlier. So I think a lot of the things that we're doing actually are gonna be, begin to make a difference. And 
what I remind people is, you know, the, the, the projection suggests that we're going to have about 100,000 deaths in this country uh, with everything we've done. And I tell people, have, and people say, well, 100,000 is not such a big deal. I mean, you know, 50,000 die of influenza every year. So why are we doing so much for this? Well, if we hadn't done the things we've done, the projections are that we would have 1.8 to 2.2 million deaths in the country. So the reality is we've been able to draw by it that a factor of 10, the number of deaths by implementing social distancing and the other things we're talking about. Thanks, Carlos. So uh, John and Gail, I know you guys, uh, as Carlos referred to, are at the epicenter of the epicenter. Can you give us a little bit about some of the things you guys have done at Weill Cornell to really try and um, sort of uh, take good care of your patients, but at the same time, be mindful of what's happening around you? I'll, I'll let Gail talk about what we've done just to give you a sense of where things are. And I know people are following the news in New York City. We are at New York Presbyterian Hospital. We're part of a nine hospital system. In the system, uh, there are about 2,200 inpatients with COVID. There are about 600 of those on ventilators and, and, and or ICU uh, beds. And um, at our particular hospital, we have about a 375 COVID positive inpatients and about 175 of those are, are intubated. So just our medicine service has a number of people being redeployed, a number of general floors being turned into ICUs and a lot of ventilator support. So I'll let Gail talk a little bit about specifically what's happening with the Hemon patients. Well, I mean, I think my first comment is, you know, I, as a diehard New Yorker and growing up here and living here, um, I just kind of can't begin to express to you what it's like to think about tents all over Central Park. And um, it's just, it's, it's the imagery of that is completely, completely extraordinary. I think we have, um, as John was describing, you know, our leadership has been extremely strong in our hospital system. And I think that this is for us at this point, you guys are talking earlier about, you know, what your thoughts are at the end of last week and how this is kind of coming, coming. We were from the beginning um, of March, sort of starting to see the reality of what was going to hit. So this is not um, a couple of days old anymore. There has been an extraordinary transformation of the inpatient services. And basically on the HEMOC side, I can only tell you what we're doing and what we're trying to do. What I can't tell you is if any of it works. And I think that's the hardest part. And the reality is what I'm going to describe in a minute. I hope it's working. I hope I'm doing the right thing. I hope we're all doing the right thing. But the truth is it's an absolute boots on the ground type of mentality where you're just trying to kind of get it, you know, do things that make sense in the moment. And there are two things to caution about. Number one is the guidance actually changes not only from day to day, but even within a day. There are guidance changes. And the second thing is that many people, um, whether it's the pundits or whether it's the comics that at the end of the day are putting together montages of what everybody said yesterday and the week before and how dumb it sounds. And I'm deathly afraid of that. So I'm just acknowledging that on this video that I'm trying very hard not to be the person who's quoted next week as look at the dumb thing she said. So protecting healthcare workers is easier said than done. Most of us are not trained for Ebola types of situations. We are not used to the donning and doffing processes. There isn't enough um, to be able to switch from room to room the way we are used to. We grew up training that when you go into a room and you come out of a room, everything changes, gown, mask, absolutely everything. And the reality is that we can't do that. So that we have all had to learn about um, probably uh, sort of conservation techniques to try to protect the gear that we have. So currently for us, for forward-facing situations, if you are in the hospital, the current guidance is you are to have a mask on at all times. If you are in the hospital, if you're alone in your office, which we are at the moment, we're not wearing a mask. But if you're in the hospital, you are to be wearing a surgical mask, not an N95, a surgical mask. That has evolved fairly recently, but it is certainly reflecting what we're seeing that there does appear to be incredible asymptomatic uh, spread. We are worried about nosocomial and iatrogenic spread. We are trying to have social distancing plus masks even while in the hospital. So the whole concept of rounds 
clustering together, standing together, none of that. It's as distant as possible with a mask on. For the N95s, we are trying very hard to protect those in the ICU and those in the ERs who are faced with literally one intubation after another after another. And those docs um, are in teams that need to be hazmat level protected. So the rest of us currently are trying to wear an N95 with a surgical mask and a face shield over it to protect the N95 so that the outer layer, which we have a bit more of, can be swapped. Is this how we were all trained? No, we were not trained to reuse a mask at all, but the reality is that we need to do that. Um, certainly in the teams that are intubating constantly and that have um, uh, major exposures anticipated, they are also wearing goggles. Those goggles are variable in what they look like and what tell you that people are thinking of bringing in their swim goggles, I am not kidding. I am sorry that I'm not kidding, but people actually are looking for that level of protective, uh, protective gear. With respect to our management of oncology patients, we realized very, very early that we were going to have to jump into um, lots of telemedicine and managing of patients um, on the outside. I think if you think about New York City, it's not difficult to figure out why we are an epicenter. There's a ton of international travel, obviously, in and out of New York that was happening all the way through the, the first couple of weeks of March. In addition to that, if you think about it, plenty of cities have subway systems, but it's hard to find a city that is as completely dependent on mass transit and the subways as we are with hundreds of thousands of people all the time moving around. So for us, what we were realizing is that if you are bringing somebody into the center, a lot of people who are in the New York area don't have a car. They're not able to get here in a socially isolated manner. They're getting here in a very exposed manner. So we were lucky. We had lots of telemedicine capabilities up and running. We started in my program in leukemia and MDS where patients are uh, neutropenic, cytopenic, very much at risk. We literally started calling patient by patient by patient and giving them our cell phone numbers, giving them direct access saying, Please don't come here until you talk to one of us first. Let's figure it out. Because if you have a symptomatic patient, right, the, the last thing you want to do is bring them in. But on the other hand, not everybody has a pulse ox at home, which, by the way, may not be a bad thing to get your hands on. But having a pulse ox at home, can we look at them? Can we monitor them? Or are we going to take a patient and put them potentially on a subway and, or a bus, bring them here, and then how do you manage the exposure of the healthcare teams when they get here? So it is bespoke medicine. It is micromanaged to the best that we can possibly do. We are delaying things that we can delay. Are you sure? Are we sure you need a transfusion? The days of bringing people in twice a week for blood and platelets are over. I'm trying to look in your mouth on the screen. Are there any blebs? Do you have any petechiae? Do we really, really have to bring you in for a transfusion? First of all, for exposure reasons, and secondly, because the blood supply is also of concern since donations are way down. If you're in remission and you're an older AML patient, are we gonna give you that maintenance cycle that randomized data don't even completely show for sure are going to prolong survival? No, I'm gonna tell you to stay locked in your house instead and let's delay that cycle for as long as possible, at least through April. For patients with curable diseases, we are trying very, very hard to stay on track. But ALL patients, if they have an intensive cycle followed by a less intensive cycle, we might switch the order of those around. And we absolutely are delaying transplants because the resources with respect to respiratory, ID, ICU, backup, all the things that you need for transplant are distracted at the moment. So transplants are delayed. And clinical trials, which hurts me deeply to say are basically shut. If we had patients on ongoing therapy that was helpful to them, we have gone through Herculean efforts and the IRBs and everybody works together with the companies, with um, investigator-initiated trials to get patients drug somehow via FedEx or via delivery or somehow to them if it's helping them. But new enrollment is essentially stopped and especially things like immunotherapies and CAR T-cell trials and others which were require broad support um, within the medical center, ID, respiratory, ICU, et cetera. So that was a long paragraph, so I want to give you a chance to uh, ask others questions. Yeah, thanks, Gail. That was really helpful and thorough. And I think 
uh, certainly many of the things that we're doing um, at Winship in terms of response to COVID-19 uh, are not dissimilar. We've not had to shut down our clinical trials to the same extent that you're describing, um, um, and certainly delaying of transplants in, in situations where they are quote unquote elective um, is certainly something that we're doing as well, but, but certainly in the AML or MDS setting where you may have a donor, you've already collected the product ahead of time, many of those are in fact proceeding uh, at least right now, um, uh, given our current level of engagement. Yeah. Give, give it a couple of days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, John, do you want to talk a little bit about how this uh, has impacted your lymphoma practice? Well, I think the um, the key things have been to really focus on who needs treatment and who can defer treatment. Um, we've largely gone to the video visits, as Gail alluded to, and I would say that uh, um, we we as a department, and I think Hemonc is probably similar, have maintained about at least two thirds of our volume, of our patient volume, but the majority of that has been video visits. Um, and so again, people getting long-term follow-ups, people uh, who have been kind of mid-cycle checks and other things, uh, we are doing a lot of video visits. We're also doing video visits for new patients. So, um, you know, most new patients, while you can't really examine them well, you have a lot of data, you may have their imaging, you may have their biopsy results. And so you can at least get a lot done and talk to people about what, what needs to be done uh, via a video visit. Um, the challenge is you don't have access to labs. So you have to figure out, you know, do you send the patient to a local lab? Do you have them come in for labs? Um, or do you just defer labs? And I think that's really an individualized decision. For the patients in the middle of treatment, I can tell you that I've started in the last week, I've started a uh, patient with newly diagnosed Hodgkin's and a lot of disease on chemotherapy as they would standardly do. I've started a couple patients with large cell lymphoma who I didn't think were gonna be able to wait for a couple of months or at least one month um, to get started on treatment. Um, on the other hand, there are some patients with indolent lymphoma that I've put off, um, and there are patients with maintenance therapy. And I would say that the, the patients with mantle cell lymphoma, with follicular lymphoma, who are on maintenance or tuximab, that's not a, a huge fraction of my indolent lymphoma patients, but for those patients, um, we generally put that off um, because the pros and cons of continuing versus uh, halting that seem to be in, in favor of of putting things off. So it's really an individualized decision, largely based on, I think, the curability of the of the disease and the sickness of, of the patient. So John, when you talk about starting patients, whether it's on salvage therapy or initial therapy, does the need to travel or uh, have those kind of frequent lab visits influence what you're choosing to use um, in terms of uh, once a week, once a month, once, you know, oral versus IV, those kinds of things. How have those played into your decision making? Yeah, I, I would say it hasn't changed much because for the curable lymphomas, we more or less have one standard treatment. I mean, in Hodgkin's, it's either ABVD or it's ABVD with brentuximab swapped in. That's basically the same treatment. The, the brentuximab is more myelosuppressive and more infection risk. But if it's a patient where I've chosen to use that, it's because I'm worried enough about the disease that the trade-off is appropriate. For large cell lymphoma, as you know, our CHOP is a standard treatment. We have had some patients where um, we've talked about, say, for instance, double hit lymphoma. Do we do our CHOP versus our EPOC when there is a, uh, at least a perceived benefit to our EPOC in double hit? Um, and, you know, that's been an individualized decision based on, on where things are. Um, so it really, I think in those situations, there's not a lot of, of big alternative as there might be, let's say, in myeloma, where you can go to an all, all oral regimen or at least for a period of time do that um, before adding something else in. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about myeloma and how we manage that. Gail, in terms of choices of therapy, when you do need to do something that can't wait, um, you know, are, is, is, is all of this changing what your choices are? 
So I would say a couple of things. The first is that with the um, expanded ability for testing and for rapid testing, which um, has been um, really week to week getting better and better and more comprehensive at our center, certainly we are before starting patients on new therapy, especially intensive chemotherapy, we are testing for COVID because those patients unfortunately can go from asymptomatic to incredibly, incredibly ill very quickly. And you're gonna wanna know what you're dealing with when you're starting intensive chemotherapy, especially in an acute loop, whether that person is struggling because of exploding COVID or because of the disease. That said, you may need to redo the testing down the road because there are, first of all, are false negatives. And secondly, there is, of course, a concern of what's happening within the hospital setting. So two weeks later, you might be redoing that test if it comes out negative initially. So we have had actually in the last several weeks, I mean, you know, AML is, um, is usually not a rare disease at uh, Wild Cornell because again, there are referrals coming in all the time from all over the place. That has actually largely stopped. So transfers as such are um, rare and far between, whereas usually we get lots of people sent in. So what I find is that I'm on the phone 20 hours a day helping manage people outside who would have otherwise normally come in. And I think the differences in what other hospitals have um, in different community settings who are managing these patients are actually driving some of the decision making. If somebody comes in with a high white count, a young patient with a high white count who needs treatment, we try to get them on their standard treatment. We are trying to get the same molecular testing and cytogenetic testing. If we can get away without a bone marrow biopsy, if the diagnosis can be made fully from the purple blood, it's a good time to conserve PPE. It's a good time to conserve the laboratory time also because they get overwhelmed and they're working on other things. So we are thinking about that. And while standardly we would always do a marrow every once in a while now, if there's a 200,000 white, 200, white count in the blood, you really don't need that marrow. If they're due for standard therapy and if they're a young patient, we try to do standard therapy. And the goal is, of course, to try very hard to keep that patient uh, protected in the hospital. For older patients, um, and, and this is true whether it's lymphoid leukemia or myeloid leukemia, and again, as John said, you know, if you if you are trying to cure the patient, we're trying to cure the patient, and we are going to um, proceed as as usual. If you have AML patients in remission, well, here there is a little bit of discussion because, for example, there's a worldwide argument about the dosing of um, conventional high DAC. Is it eight grams per meter squared, 12 grams, 18 grams? Well, this probably isn't an 18 gram moment for those patients who are in remission. So you want to maybe be a bit gentler, go to that 12, go to that eight, get them something, but don't necessarily put them at high risk. And especially depending on how they are commuting back and forth to the center for labs and so forth, this wouldn't necessarily be um, that 18 gram per meter squared consolidation moment. Similarly, if you are two cycles in or three cycles in, there are lots of raging debates on whether for standard AML, which you're using high dositerabine consolidation, well, what's the right number? Is it three cycles? Is it four cycles? Now is not a four cycle moment for sure. And in the middle of April in New York, I can tell you that cycle three is not going to happen either. We want to delay. Similarly, for older patients than 60, where the data for high dose uh, RSC consolidation are shaky anyway, this would not be a time to start taking those patients in, at least in our area, to high dose consolidation. We would be moving to either delaying consolidation or to using a hypomethylating agent based approach. Now, hypomethylating agents in combination with venetoclax have really taken over for AML therapy and for even high risk MDS therapy for older patients. However, here, I think it's also, it's very bespoke decision making because the issue is while these are less um, intensive with respect to extramedullary complications, they are myelosuppressive. They really are. And if you take a patient and you give them what is currently the standard of an, or of an azacitidine in 20 or 21 days of venetoclax, that patient has really low counts. And depending on where they're located and how they're getting back and forth to the center, we are changing what we're doing. And I can tell you, I have colleagues in upstate New York who have practices where the patient goes with the car and they can telemedicine check in for their visit and stick their arm out the window and get a lab check that that way, that's not New York City. So we might sometimes have patients scattered in other states in Connecticut and upstate New York where they can get 
care in, in, a, in a more isolated manner than what they could do in the city. But the bottom line is, if you're going to get an older patient in remission, even with an HMA and venetoclax-based regimen, that is a, a relatively intensive and still myelosuppressive regimen. So you have to make plans with the patient for what the monitoring is going to be. The very difficult conversations that we are having many times a day, and they are, um, they're rough, are for patients with um, very frail older patients with newly diagnosed disease where you might be pausing anyway about treating them or patients with relapsed refractory disease. Um, the heartbreaking circumstances of being alone and frightened in the hospital without family support, I just, I can't discuss that enough. It is so hard and so not how any of us were trained. We are used to showering patients with, um, with tremendous support. And in this era, it's very difficult. So I will tell you that for patients where you really are not thinking that they are going to have any durable survival based on their underlying disease or whether they would have a very difficult induction time, the patients do have to have that discussion about, do you really want to try to go through all of this without anyone being totally alone in the hospital. And even with respect to physician contact, everything is limited. It's different from usual. We are actually calling our patients on the cell phone from outside the room rather than going into the rooms in order to limit exposure. And this is devastating um, for, you know, for things like AML induction, which could be prolonged stays. So I will say that you have to really, really think carefully, what are you doing for the patient? Is this patient definitely, do they really have a shot at it? or is this somebody where you should be managing things supportively at home and trying to get some of the now increasingly limited but still available home services to try to help you keep the patient together with family? Thanks. You know, I think that last point about whatever you do to patients in the hospital, they're going to be on their own is a really important one. Um, it's a hard, it's, you know, you're right, 30 days is hard to spend alone. And and I remember, you know, when I when I gave a talk in China years ago, they won't let any family members visit on the transplant units in many of the cities there. And I thought that was crazy. Um, and now we've gone to that same sort of approach here for the reasons you've described. And that really does, uh, everybody needs to know that before you commit to a, to a treatment like that. Um, you know, in, in the myeloma world, there's uh, we took a lot of our leads from our colleagues uh, in Europe who, again, were well ahead of even where you all are in New York, both the Italian and the Spanish groups. Uh, dealing with infected patients on and off therapy. Um, and uh, certainly a couple of simple things that were done, uh, the minimizing of uh, DARA infusion. So rather than going every week or every two weeks in, a, in using an antibody that we know shuts down T cells, uh, going to once a month at the most is probably what most groups have, have, have switched to. Reducing dexamethasone dosing is something else. You know, we often use dex a lot. Uh, but again, trying to minimize the impact that may have on, on immunity to prevent or minimize the effect of, of, the, of the viral infection. The Europeans were very positive about switching to completely oral regimens and taking out uh, uh, some of the proteasome inhibitors and replacing them with oral cyclophosphamide. And we had a long and robust discussion about that in our group here. And we have uh, been very concerned that simply switching out and using oral cyclophosphamide in myeloma may actually make things worse. You may actually genetically be making the disease more challenging to deal with. And so at least for now, where we're able to give a, a once a week subcutaneous dose of, of bortezomib, uh, we, we've sort of stuck with that and not made the, the all out switch for cyclophosphamide, uh, even though it's oral. Um, and then the delaying of auto transplants, particularly in standard risk patients, where giving a cycle or two more, trying to see where we are in May uh, and make decisions about maybe we'll go to transplant now um, is something that we've done in the myeloma community as well to try and mitigate the impact, but still try and give patients therapy that can ultimately uh, improve their outcomes. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, so I'm, there are a lot of questions coming through, which is good. Uh, one of them, and I don't know whether it would be Gail or John that answers this, it's about CLL and abrutinib. Um, what would you do with somebody um, who's got CLL and is COVID positive on abrutinib? Uh, certainly, there's all this sort of hand-waving data with Revlimid in patients with myeloma that it may actually help activate T cells and NK cells. Abrutinib, I'm not sure whether you'd say it's anti or suppressive or activating, but what would you guys do with somebody with CLL on abrutinib? Yeah, I think it's yeah, I think it's very hard to say as you uh, put it all together. I think that 
you know, in general, I've kept my patients on a brutinib. I think if they had an active mm -hmm. infection going on, uh, I would probably be inclined to pause it for a while um, in the absence of any data, just as we sometimes do uh, in patients who are cytopenic and have infections and other things on a brutinib. So I would, at this point, I've left my patients alone who were on it, but I think if they had a significant infection, I'd probably take a pause. Uh, and Gail, certainly for, for Aza or Decidabine, depending upon which uh, flavor you prefer to use, uh, when you do need to use it, are you still going five days? Are you changing the schedule or dose or what you're doing or how are you approaching that? We are, we're doing our best. And I think that there are actually very limited data um, in the post-remission setting in particular that ongoing cycles of equivalent duration for what you did during induction make sense. And I can tell you, having been on a million panels discussing this even before COVID, the last thing you want to do, especially for older patients who are now enjoying remission in a um, hypomethylating agent and venetoclax-based regimen, you don't want to hurt them in remission. So I will confess to making up things like three days of an HMA and five days of venetoclax, and I, I'm, I'm owning it. We don't have the data. We're trying really hard, though. I personally and my team on leukemia is trying really hard to capture what we're doing for data, and I have spoken with groups through the world. We think that this is going to be, I mean, it's kind of a, a mandatory opportunity to look and see if we can put together what we're doing internationally in small, you know, in, in relatively rare diseases and see if some of these modifications to therapy, how, how did they turn out? But I think that the exposure, depending on the patient coming mm. into the center, for example, for five days in a row versus three days in a row, that actually might matter a lot. So yes, we are making that change. And it might azacitidine be given sub Q instead of IV if it preserves some element of gear? Yes, absolutely, that decision could be made. Might you sometimes do something like say, I'm not bringing you in at all, but I'm going to give you X number of days of venetoclax alone? I, you might. There are no data to do that, but we are all trying to do things um, to also support our patients psychologically. And I can tell you that it is enormously, enormously stressful on top of stressful for patients on regimens of ongoing therapy that are working to make changes. And sometimes if you have to say, well, you're normally getting five days of azacitidine and five days of venetoclax in a post permission setting, well, this time I'm just gonna do the venetoclax alone. This is not how any of us were trained. I know that this is complete anathema to be saying anything like this for a clinical trialist and for somebody who usually likes to use data, but this is war and we are we are making modifications like that to try to get patients out of the center. I would say if you're going to suppress someone in remission, you need to have a really good reason to do that, especially for an older patient. And certainly in the New York area and increasingly in urban areas, if you just think about what the patient is going to need, you have to have a mental picture of what they are going to need to do in order to get from their house to your office and sort of think about it. How many surfaces are going to be touched? How many people are going to be seen? Is the risk actually worth it? I think all of a sudden, lots of things become reasonable that you wouldn't have thought were reasonable before. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Gail. And I'm going to come to you in a second with this question I'm going to ask John as well. So I'm giving you a, a little bit of time to prepare. But John, so if you had somebody that got our EPOC or our CHOP and was either infected before and you didn't know it or became infected during that period of, uh, of myelosuppression after therapy, what'd you do and did you restart? So I've not, at least to my knowledge, I've not had that happen uh, uh, yet. I think that uh, hopefully I won't, but uh, statistically, there's probably a chance that that will happen. Um, I think that, you know, ideally I would take a pause and let the patient recover and get through the acute uh, illness. Um, obviously, we don't know uh, how much uh, that would impact uh, the situation. It probably wouldn't help it and certainly could make it worse, just like any other, you know, viral uh, infection that a patient uh, had so I you know if I if I detected like any other illness uh, I would try to take a pause and I'd probably be a little more liberal now uh, or a lot more liberal now about taking a pause than I normally am as far as trying to keep people uh, on time. And Gail mentioned testing before intensive chemotherapy. 
uh, we're having a big debate on what the threshold for what regimen should have testing and what shouldn't. Are you testing before RCHOP, for instance, or how are you making that call for lymphoma regimens? We, um, we have not routinely tested outpatients before starting them on treatment if they were asymptomatic. Um, that may well change, and I think, again, as Gail alluded to, the availability of testing is, uh, is something that's rapidly changing from day to day and week, week to week. Um, the other issue is uh, obviously that testing a patient in the proper way um, it means that you're sticking a nasal swab pretty far back down their throat and getting coughed on, uh, most likely. And so the idea of testing someone or the ability to test someone um, is complicated because you essentially give up that room and have to have the PPE and everything else. It's uh, not that easy to do kind of on the fly. Um, but that said, I, I think that uh, certainly we may be reevaluating that in our outpatients as well. I think the inpatient risk is something that is uh, um, clearly different centers, including ours, are, are looking at that on a day-to-day -day basis, in part because if you have an inpatient um, and you're uh, having a cult affection in an inpatient and you have uh, people going in and out of the room, you have the, the the possibility of knocking out half of your leukemia team, for example, uh, for a period of time, as well as obviously more importantly, the the, the real risk to them as opposed to just the uh, exposure risk. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, John, especially about the testing piece. And I wanna know which uh, Cornell faculty member volunteered to test the Bronx Zoo Tiger, uh, because yeah. I can't imagine doing that nasal swab. Uh, well, I, I will mention that we have had, uh, we set up in the early stages of this, we set up uh, uh, in our, for our institution, uh, we have a, a general medicine cough and cold uh, clinic so that patients who meet criteria of needing testing can be referred to a specific uh, uh, center, uh, outpatient, it's across the street, but a, a dedicated clinic where it's all set up to do uh, PPE as you walk as you walk in and um, the, the right, uh, everything is all set up to do that. And I would encourage centers to, um, to develop those and take advantage of those. And I think um, if I had a symptomatic patient uh, and in fact have had symptomatic patients, that's where we've referred them for their evaluation just because it's a much more efficient process. Yeah, and we've done that. Go ahead, Gail. I was just going to say there's one other um, uh, consideration here. Um, so first of all, <laughs> those of us with dogs in New York City, we're not very happy about the whole tiger situation because we're already looking at the dogs as a acute but nonetheless fomite potentially. But that's a different question. Um, the one thing that I thought would, just to add to John's comments about sort of what happens if you're in the middle of therapy or if you're initiating therapy. So depending on where you are, and this is a huge hotbed of controversy, um, anyone who watches the news, I try not to, um, as seen the raging debates on the um, hydroxychloroquine, but we are treating um, at Weill Cornell currently in patients with um, hydroxychloroquine. And I think that when you think about what happens with a patient who is uh, starting out on whether it's EPOC or, or intensive therapy, there are potential drug interactions and so forth that come into the mix when you are contemplating somebody who becomes sick in the middle of therapy A, and B, I can tell you our experience on, on the inpatient service is uh, fortunately limited so far with people who are kind of converting in the middle of their therapy, but it doesn't, it, it, it goes with difficulty when that is happening. It's not, it's not a good news scenario. And I think that part of the decision-making in terms of what you're gonna do versus abort versus change also has to do with the, um, what, what is the institutional policy and what are ID and HEMONC and the other groups doing in terms of hydroxychloroquine? Now, there are um, large studies, which we are trying very hard to join. There is um, an NIH study that we are due to start, um, hopefully um, in a couple of weeks, to actually participate in this. I think all of us have been concerned um, for a lot of reasons about the presentation of randomized data. Randomized data with 12 people, 10 of whom had weird therapies, 
that that's not randomized data. It is definitely the case that there are interesting aspects to hydroxychloroquine that look promising, but usually you need a lot more information. And certainly for complicated patients with comorbidities and other things going on, we like to have more. That said, in the hospital setting, many, many centers are using it fairly routinely. So you do have to think about it and be ready that if you're talking azole antifungals or lots of other things that would be common in heme onc land, you do have to, you have to think about those. With respect to heme onc outpatients, we are also working on looking at this, that is there a rationale for these very high risk patients to be a little bit earlier in potentially screening and looking at them. And this comes up every single day. There's a new difficult scenario. So I have a patient whose husband just tested positive. So what is the likelihood that she's going to be positive? It's very high because the husband is positive and they've been in the same room the whole time and everybody is relatively asymptomatic except the kid who was 20 whatever was positive recently. So is one going to be then proactive about testing that person so that you could try to get your hands on um, hydroxychloroquine, either on a study, hopefully, or off study. And again, here too, the reality is that in different states and different communities, doctors are handling this in very, very different and difficult manners. And it's really hard when you're trying to take care of a patient and do one thing, and they're getting told by the, the friend of the family physician who's somewhere else, whatever, that no, you have to go on to hydroxychloroquine. So that is a reality. I think it's pointless for doctors to deny that it's going on. People are scared. They wanna take anything that seems like it will work. I don't even think you can buy vitamin C or zinc on Amazon anymore because that and toilet paper are way, way off the shelves. And I think we just have to assess the reality that people are doing, taking, thinking about anything that even somebody said once on Twitter might work. And we have to incorporate that into our daily reality. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a that's a really important set of, uh, of discussions and concerns. And it, there's one thing to have two cooks in the kitchen. Uh, oftentimes we've got a thousand and that, that does complicate medical decision making. So we've got uh, a few minutes left and a lot of questions here. So uh, Carlos, I've got a couple for you. Uh, one is, could you discuss the role of micro droplet in spread of 19 and will the impending summer, and I will tell you in Atlanta, it was uh, 78, 80 degrees here this weekend. Uh, it was actually quite nice with the flowers blooming. Uh, will that slow down or uh, slow transmission? So, so those are really important questions. I think that the more we learn about transmission, the, uh, this is primarily a droplet, either small droplet or large droplet, but there's always concerns about aerosolization. And I think that aerosol generating procedures may play a role in certain uh, places. And I think about, for example, either art aer aerosolization like in a bronchoscopy, but also quite frankly, or in, in, in induced butum or nebulization or a BiPAP, but also, you know, uh, there's been a couple of outbreaks in, in different places about cores, saying about in, in cores is that I think aerosolization is playing a role. Uh, but in general, most of the transmission is is small droplet and, 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 and large droplet that is falling down. And I, I, I think as, as Gail said, we have done the same thing at Grady. Everybody inside the hospital is wearing a mask and I think we need to be wearing a mask. It, we're doing N95 simply because we have a plenty supply by 95s and we don't have enough surgical masks, but Emory Healthcare is doing surgical masks and not N95s because they have a limited supply of N95. So you have to be masked either one way or the other because I think that will help you in, in the healthcare setting. The, uh, the Obviously the other question is at what point in time do we mask patients, right? And you know, what what is the issue there? Especially when patients are coming into the ED and they're undiagnosed and we don't know what's wrong with them. I think that's another question that comes up. The other question is about the weather. You know, we're all praying, we're all hopeful that the warm weather is gonna be helpful because we know this virus at, at 30 degrees and above doesn't do that well. But I would tell you that they're having a fairly significant outbreak in Australia right now, and it's summer down there. So I'm, I'm not terribly helpful. In Miami right now, my son lives in Miami, it's close to 80 degrees right now in Miami, and they're having a big outbreak there. So I am not sure the weather is gonna be necessarily in our favor uh, going forward, but you know, who, who knows? Uh, I mean, there's so many things about this virus and this outbreak that we just don't understand that I think we, we need we need to honestly more time. And and simply the, the infections are happening much faster than we can actually either make, you know, make science, make policy or make decisions. So we're all making decisions based on very limited data and 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 that's really hard to do. And it's it's very frustrating because that's now how we are used to operate, right? 
Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. So Gail and John, are you guys giving any therapies at home, whether it's IV or sub Q? Is that something that has sort of been forced into action by limitations? Well, from my perspective, there has been a um, actually progressive decline in what can actually be done um, with respect to visiting nurses and so forth. It's just gotten kind of smaller and smaller. I think that, um, you know, there's so much need uh, in the hospitals, but but it's difficult to allocate um, one's strengths correctly, right? So you need people to be building tents and creating rooms and creating capacity. Not all, all of us would be very helpful in that team. You need a ton of respiratory therapists and a ton of people who are not 25 years out from their residency trying to manage vents and going up on this and down on that. So in the field, though, what has happened is that, first of all, there is an increasing fear, of course, of um, and, and protection of the healthcare workers who are going out into the field. But secondly, there seems to be an incredible shrinkage of that supply. So the ability to get a PICC line cleaned, a sub-Q injection, a lab checked at home in the immediate New York area has gotten worse. There are still areas outside of the city where that's more readily available. So for patients with access to either another home or to a family member who lives somewhere outside the city, that is definitely being done. And when things can be handled at home, it's sometimes better, but I will tell you there too that due to varying accessibility to PPE, I have been told multiple stories of visiting nurses or other providers arriving without what our patients felt was appropriate PPE. So that poses a whole other set of problems because then you're advising something, but then you're in an awkward situation of trying to convince the person who's arrived without a mask that they should not enter the home. So it's complicated. John, no, no uh, sub Q rituximab at home. No, we've not. <laughs> not uh, so far, we've not uh, really done that uh, on a on a uh, big level. I think somebody getting single agent rituximab. Um, on a maintenance kind of perspective is somebody who probably can go without for a little while for the most part. So that's been the general the general path. Yeah, no, I think that's an important point about can you go without? Um, we certainly have people that are on induction therapy and are in complete remission and are on cycle 25 or 30. And we're saying, take the month off, we'll reassess in a month and make a decision about whether you need to come back in. Uh, patients that are on twice a week carfilzomib dosing schedule, go to once a week if they're having a good response, minimize their interaction, and, and whether it's IV or sub-Q, do whatever you can to minimize their time in the, in the chair. Um, um, uh, we've got just a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to ask um, Gail and John to give us advice and recommendations for oncology clinicians in your areas of specialty, 30 seconds, and then 30 seconds advice and recommendations for patients and caregivers. So Gail, why don't we start with you? Um, I think, you know, protect yourself and your team. You can't help people um, if you're sick. And we already have colleagues who are out sick with COVID. It is upsetting. So we try really hard to work with the institution to encourage. I would I would advocate a very conservative approach to PPE. I was somebody who probably at the end of February would not have been able to imagine wearing a mask all the time. I don't know where you are, but wear the mask all the time. Be quite conservative. Preserve your PPE and make sure that your teams are doing the same. And have the individual conversations with the patient in a divided way. What are we talking about that's affected by COVID? And what are we talking about that would be the same conversation without it? I think that has helped me and it's helped my patients a lot because you don't want them to feel that absolutely everything about their care is blown up because of COVID. If you divide it, that this is what this is what the reality is of your disease and what we would do irrespective of COVID, I think it helps. Yeah, thanks, Gail. We didn't get a chance to talk about cohorted care teams as an effort to try and protect the teams uh, uh, to minimize exposure, but that's something I think uh, all of us are are trying to do as well. John, how about from the lymphoma perspective? Yeah, I think uh, I would echo much of what Gail said. I think from the provider's perspective, um, uh, you know, I, I would focus a bit on what happens if your team or you um, get infected or get exposed and what are you gonna do and how are you gonna plan for that? Um, and that's, you know, really, I think everybody in their own house. What happens if somebody gets sick? 
uh, in your apartment, in your house? Are you going to quarantine to a bedroom and a bathroom? Are you going to go to a hotel? How are you going to manage that? Who's going to take care of your kid, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Those are, are big issues for everyone. And I would just say for patients, um, the, the biggest thing is the strain that everyone sees and recognizes on healthcare providers, nurses, um, technicians, uh, even the uh, receptionist at the clinic is, is taking on some risk as well as the physicians. And I, I, it's been gratifying to see the appreciation that's been given to people. I think patients are very much um, reaching out to their providers. How are you doing? Uh, thank you for what you do. Um, we've got We've had uh, people donating food to our ICUs like crazy. I mean, uh, and lots of other things. And I, I would say to patients, uh, in addition to taking care of yourself, um, those are very meaningful things and help build our relationships that when we're seeing each other regularly, uh, I think will help everyone all around and really uh, remember, remind us that we're all in this together. Yeah, thanks, John. And certainly from a myeloma perspective, I think much of it overlaps with what you guys have already said. Uh, be safe. Uh, you know, what I what I tell our teams and what I tell our patients is um, everybody that you interact with, I now interact with as well, because um, uh, what you expose yourself to, you're exposing the team to. And so make sure that uh, those of us who are committed to direct patient care uh, are minimizing risk, not just to each other, but to our patients and our colleagues by really trying to do the social distancing piece and whether it's masks and goggles and all sorts of other things. Um, your cohort is now our cohort, and let's make sure we keep it as tight and, and uh, infection-free as we can. Uh, Carlos, you got to give us the hopeful word to go out on. So uh, tell us this is all going to be better. Well, you know, I think it's going to be better because we have science and we have research happening, and I think this is, emphasizes the importance of science and research. It is through science and through research that we, you know, quickly after the discovery of the virus, we had the genome, we, had a te we have tests, we have plenty of tests, we have trials of, of drugs. We have a vaccine now in, in phase one studies. So I think the answer to this is right now it's public health is the things we're talking about. It's, it's, it's social distancing, is this kind of interventions, non-pharmacological interventions. But I think in, in, I don't know, a year from now, if this disease is still around, it's gonna be very different because we're gonna be in a very different position. And we're gonna be in a different position because of science. So I want to emphasize the value of clinical research and the value of basic research is really getting us out of problems like this one. Thanks, Carlos. And just remember, next time you see Carlos on CNN, you heard it here first. So uh, <laughs> remember that. And thank you to Gail and John for all your help and really insightful comments. Visit uh, bioascend.com to view the recording uh, uh, and for additional educational offerings in the future. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. A pleasure to be with you.